given to us. So uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry, aren't they always, and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priest? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priest in the temple profaned the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Now when he had departed from there, he went uh, into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? And he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath? will not lay hold of it and lift it out. Or how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out. It was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Uh, we do love you, Jesus. And uh, we are absolutely convinced that you love us. And could we grasp that tonight? Could we, could we get a hold of that tonight? Could that come through loud and clear tonight? Could everything else be pushed aside? And could we understand tonight the depth of your love? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Really worried about tonight and what we're going to share uh, and what we're going to talk about in relationship to this passage. And uh, my, I, I don't know for sure, but I would, I would imagine it's going to get worse. For tonight is kind of an introduction to the whole thing. Uh, it'll probably get worse. Uh, the reason uh, I'm a little worried is because of my own personal tradition and what I'm discovering in this passage in light of the it just, it, it really, you should stay out of the Word of God. I recommend that you do not read the Bible. Uh, what I recommend is that you just stick with the traditions you've always had, and then you'll just be okay. Uh, and nothing will upset you. In, in, but to get into the Word of God, this is so amazing to me because it just it absolutely is upsetting all of my traditions. I was raised, of course, in the tradition of uh, Sunday was the Sabbath day. Sabbath day, you realize, for the Jew was from uh, Friday night at 6 o'clock to Saturday night, uh, Saturday evening at 6 o'clock. So that 24-hour period, that was the Sabbath day. And, of course, that's gone. We understand that in Jewish tradition, that's gone. And we transferred it over to our Sunday. So we call our Sunday the Sabbath day, which isn't the Sabbath day at all because it's really Saturday. But we call it the Sabbath day. In fact, there's another denomination that argues about that, that we ought to worship on Saturday, which would really be the Sabbath day. But so here we are, worshiping on Saturday. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> I was raised in the tradition that our Sunday was the Sabbath day, and, of course, we had all of these oral traditions that we had been, uh, that we uh, attached to that Sabbath day. And, of course, all of you are too young to know anything about that. But, uh, for instance, we couldn't read a newspaper on the Sabbath day, on Sunday. Uh, we couldn't even take a paper on Sunday. Uh, lest, uh, we couldn't go out to eat on Sunday, but our, my wife could work hard and cook for hours, but you couldn't go out and eat. Um, we had a lot of Sabbath day rules uh, that couldn't play ball on Sunday, definitely couldn't watch TV on Sunday. In fact, I'm not sure what you could do on Sunday you could take a nap. I know that. We did take naps. We could take a uh, Nazarene nap. That was, that was in. Uh, there was just a lot of that kind of thing that I grew up with. And as you march into this whole passage, there's just an explosion going on in this passage about 
the oral traditions and the applications of the laws of God and the commandments and all that's involved in that focus over against Jesus and what he's really concerned about. And what we're after tonight is not to downplay rules or not to downplay uh, applications, not to downplay any standard that you have for your life, whatever standard you have for your life, good for you. Uh, but we are here in an attempt tonight to upplay the love of Jesus. He loves you so much that he loves you over the top of the commandments. I mean, you've got to come to grips with that. That even when you break the commandments, he loves you. And he loves you over the top of the commandments. That doesn't mean there isn't commandments, but it does mean that his focus is not on the commandments. His focus is on you and how much desperately, desperately, desperately he loves you. And that what he wants is not you to keep a commandment. What he wants is for you to love him back in such intimacy and such oneness that you wouldn't do anything to hurt him at all. And it would have, and doesn't have anything to do with keeping commandments. Because you could keep commandments and stab him in the back. So it isn't about the commandment. It's about a love relationship with Jesus that's so tight and so intimate in your life that you would rather die than hurt him. That's what I'd like to get you into. That's what I want to be into. I want a heart that's so intimate with his that I think like he thinks and I feel like he th feels and and. My judgments are like his judgments and what hurt hi hurts him hurts me and what he wants is what I want and I want to be so intimate with him in that kind of connection that commandments are immaterial because the heart of God is literally my high priority because I want his mind and his heart and we are absolutely in love. Uh, so that's where we're going tonight. And I don't want you to get lost in all of this. You realize at the end of chapter 11, uh, Matthew, of course, is recording that Jesus is giving this phenomenal invitation. And last Saturday night, we talked uh, again about this invitation. And he is giving an invitation to the exhausted ones, which is the word that is given to us in verse 28 for labor. And, of course, the heavy laden ones, which is the word for freight loaded on a ship. So it's the individuals who are absolutely work themselves to death and who absolutely have such burdens laid upon them that, it, that they can hardly function. And the exhaustion and the burden that he's talking about are the oral traditions and the commandments that have been heaped upon them. Here's a whole Jewish society that is literally bogged down with so many rules and so many traditions and so many ceremonies and so many things to do and not do that they are literally their whole attention and energy is wrapped up in that and they are exhausted over it and he is inviting them to come and we suggested to you that there are there were, were three playouts of this three ingredients to this one was the idea of the responsibility that he is taking on the responsibility for your life and we saw that in the pronouns, which just is amazing to me. And it's just so amazing that I got to do it again. i say it to you again. Verse 28, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am lowly in heart, gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, he's taking ownership of this whole thing. And he's inviting you to come and get in on it. <laughs> huh, that's phenomenal. So he's given you an invitation to come out of the responsibility of your own activity and your own life, come out from being the resource of your own existence, come out from the responsibility of whatever's going on in your life and to come into him and rest. Beautiful. And, of course, with that goes this whole idea of resource, which we talked about, which is all wrapped up in verse 30. For my yoke is easy, and we have discussed the fact that that word is just absolutely impossible to describe 
uh, the Greek word is absolutely impossible to describe, but it has the idea to furnish what is needed. So he is inviting you to come into his ownership, into his, his platform wh where he is, and he's inviting you to get in on link with the resource of his person because it's a yoke. It's a yoke, and he's saying, come on, link with me. Link with me. But I'm weak, I know, but I'm strong, so it'll be okay. I'll make up for you. That's neat, isn't it? So in my weakness, he wants me to link with his great strength, and he will be the total resource for my life. And then we talked about the burden is light, which is the relationship idea. Again, it's all mixed together, of course, with the yoke idea. And the light is, uh, uh, the burden is light is only, it's only used twice. That word is only used twice in the whole New Testament. And it, uh, it, it's, it's not the removal of the yoke. It's that in the weakness, in my weakness, I'm linking with him, and he's got adequate strength for both of us. So my problems will be the same. Doesn't matter. But I'm not on my own in the problem. Because the problem, the burden just got lighter. Why? Because of his resource in relationship with him. Come to me, all you who labor. Now, in that context, there is no question that the rest he is talking about is from the overwhelming burden of legalism that was laid upon the Jews. There's no question that that's the whole discussion that he is having in that as he saw his own people with this oral tradition just bogged down in that. Now, it's really interesting then that he comes, Matthew comes into chapter 12, and the first thing he does in chapter 12, linking with that discussion, is he gives us two illustrations about the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath day, the Greek word for Sabbath day, literally means rest, ceasing from labor. Now you got to, I mean, come on, you don't have to be brilliant to figure out he's linking these stories with this invitation. That the, the, he didn't accidentally put these two stories right here. Come on. This is flowing. He's flowing out of the invitation of you're weary, you're bogged down, you just you don't know how you're going to make it, you're exhausted, you, you need additional resource. Oh, and hey, come to me. I'll, I, my yoke, link with me, and I, I'll be your resource. He's, he's taking that whole scene and he's linking it with this Sabbath day idea. It's just... Beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful. And he gives us these two stories. Now, how important are these stories? Well, number one, they're important because they're in the Bible. We understand that. But number two, they're in all three Gospels, Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There aren't a lot of stories that are in all three Gospels. And man, when you see them, these two stories in all Gospels, that lines you up to say, whoa, they all thought this was important. The Holy Spirit thought this was so important, he said, I'm going to say it three times. So that really makes these stories significant. Now, the danger tonight is going to be that you're going to get all wrapped up in a discussion on the Sabbath day and think that's what he's discussing here when he's not discussing the Sabbath day at all. The point of the stories is not the Sabbath day. Well, that's what he's talking about. I know. But he's using that as a platform to, for you to visualize something that is bigger. And one of the things that he's doing with these two stories is, he says, I want you to get a view of rest. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light, and I will give you rest. So the rest, what is the rest? He says, let me give you a contrasting picture of rest. Over here on this side is the Pharisees and how they feel about rest. Over here on this side is Jesus 
and his view of rest. And we're going to contract. It has nothing to do with Saturday, Sabbath day, whether you can play football on Sunday or not. See, don't think in those terms, because if you do, you'll miss the whole thing. Because the whole focus of what he's going to discuss is not Sabbath day rules. The whole thing he's discussing is the idea of rest. How the Pharisees views rest, how Jesus views rest. And he's contrasting it. Got it? Three of you. Okay. Now, to begin with, we want to start with the historical context of the Sabbath day, which is important. And to see this in its context. So the historical context of the Sabbath day. And I'm going to say some things that uh, in, my, um, in my tradition should not be said. From where I come from, I should not say these things. I mean, it's heresy. But I don't know what to do about it. Because I'm faced with it in the scriptures. and psst. I mean, I could lie about it. Not that I haven't done that at times, but I don't want to do that tonight. <laughs> oh, Now, the historical context of the Sabbath day is the Ten Commandments. That's interesting in itself. You've got ten moral laws given by God, written on tablets of stone, handed to the people of Israel, and in the middle of it, the fourth one, is keep the Sabbath day holy. But what's so interesting about it is that all other nine commandments are moral commandments. They have to do with your relationship with God, having no other gods before him. There are spiritual, moral commandments. But not the Sabbath day. That's the only one out of them that's a non-moral commandment that really focuses on ceremonies. I knew this would make you mad. That's interesting, isn't it? And it's interesting when you come to the New Testament, the other nine commandments are emphasized that we Christians should embrace, but we are never, ever told to embrace the Sabbath day commandment. Whew. That really makes you mad, doesn't it? That no place in the New Testament, this is radical, folks, no place in the New Testament are we taught that we Christians should keep the Sabbath day holy. I don't know what you want to do with that. Maybe you don't want to do anything about it. Just forget it and act like I didn't say it, and I'll be happy. Uh, the commandment that God gave in the Ten Commandments about the Sabbath day only had one single requirement about it. Didn't say anything about football. Didn't say anything about taking a newspaper on Sunday. Didn't say anything about going out to eat on Sunday. It only said one single thing, and that was do you shall do no work. That was the commandment. That the whole commandment focused on the work idea. I'm watching you. Focuses on the work idea. It's the only thing that God laid out. Now the difficulty then with that whole thing is, what is work? Because if I'm not supposed to work, but then I never have because I've preached all my life. But anyhow, if you're not supposed to work, what is work? How do you define it? What can you and can you not do on the Sabbath day if God is commanding that you do no work on the Sabbath day? So the Israelites, the Jews, formulated the oral tradition. And the oral tradition was to take the idea of do not work and say, what is work? And then begin to define it so that we could really nail down what we can do on the Sabbath day and what we cannot do. 
Now, they did this over a period of several hundred years, and they fine-tuned it until it was really, really strong, really, really had it together. And there were absolutely thousands of applications in trying to describe what work was. In fact, I want to read you a quote. Uh, someone said in that day that it was more tiresome to keep the Sabbath day than the six days devoted to one's occupation. That God made the Sabbath day for rest and it wears you out more to do that than it does to work all week making a living. Why? Because there was so many regulations and so many, so many applications and so many rules connected with and so much rigmarole about the Sabbath day and what work was that it just absolutely, I mean, just getting ready for the Sabbath day wore you out. They really went after it. Now, to show you that this was not just some theological argument, this was not just some, uh, oh, well, yeah, you believe that, I believe this kind of thing, I want to give you two illustrations, historical illustrations, that show you how absolutely dedicated they were to the Sabbath day and the keeping of the Sabbath day and not working on the Sabbath day. One, this tells you how serious they really were. One is that the Greeks, the Greek army came and was going to attack uh, Jerusalem. And this was days in the, in the, back in the days of uh, Judas Maccabees uh, <coughs> uh, before the New Testament. And during that time, the Greek army came and was attacking Jerusalem. And they discovered the Israelite commitment to not work on the Sabbath day. So, duh, you know what they did. They came on the Sabbath day to fight the Israelites. And not one man raised the sword to defend his family, protect his children, and thousands of women and children were absolutely slaughtered along with the men because they would not lift a sword on the Sabbath day. Now, you can say, well, it's just theology. Not to them it wasn't. This was a real serious commitment about the Sabbath day and these oral interpretations. Let me give you another illustration. Rome came Pomp under Pompey, came to attack Jerusalem. And he discovered this same principle. And in those days, the way you would attack a fortified city like Jerusalem is, you would build as close as you could to it a huge mound. You'd just bring dirt and keep piling and piling and piling until you had a mound that was level with the top of the wall. Then you would bring in your, they were like big slingshots, you've seen them, and, and they, would, they would throw these rocks and break the walls. So Pompey had his army build this, but he, the Jews wouldn't allow that to be built because they would fight them off but not on the Sabbath day. So he only built the mound on the Sabbath day. So week after week after week on the Sabbath day, this mound is built, and finally, he could attack the city with his equipment and break the walls, and he slaughtered Jerusalem. That's how committed they were to the Sabbath day. So this is not some light, superficial, it doesn't matter kind of thing. This is deep, deep commitment. The oral tradition that we're talking about concerning the Sabbath day was finally written down in the Jewish Talmud. And in the Jewish Talmud, when they wrote it down, 24 of the chapters of the Talmud were dedicated to the Sabbath day law which was humongous. So their large attention of the Jewish law was dedicated to this Sabbath day idea. And I want to walk you through, just for the fun of it, some of the things, by the way, 
when you broke the Sabbath day law, it was punishable by death, which tells you how serious they are. And they stoned their people to death. So you were, see, you could throw stones on the Sabbath day, but there's a lot of other things you couldn't do. You could kill people, but you couldn't. For instance, the area of travel. You were only allowed to travel 3,000 feet on the Sabbath day. Whew. That would cut you down, wouldn't it? 3,000 feet. 3,000 feet from where? 3,000 feet for your home. But they designed this idea that really your home, if you go 3,000 feet from your home and you stay within that 3,000 feet and if you'll put food there and eat, then that becomes an extension of your home. Then you can travel 3,000 feet from that spot. If you tie a rope from the corner of your house, take it across the street and attach it to the building across the street, that building then becomes an extension of your home and extends your 3,000 feet. Think of how many ropes were stretched. Interesting that the transporting idea, carrying things, you could not carry anything on the Sabbath day that weighed over what a dried fig weighed. That's really small. So there was absolutely no carrying, transporting anything on the Sabbath day. There were these eating restrictions. It was worse than a diet. They were so detailed and extensive in this. You couldn't eat anything larger than an olive. And if you were eating the olive and you bit half of it and found it was rotten and spit it out, that counted as a part of your meal. Detailed, detailed. A tailor, a seamstress, would not carry a needle on the Sabbath day because he might be tempted to make a stitch. And you were only allowed two stitches on the Sabbath day. There was no trading, no buying, and no selling, absolutely none on the Sabbath day. You could not wash your clothes or dye your garments on the Sabbath day. You could not post a letter on the Sabbath day. In fact, you were not even allowed to let a Gentile who wouldn't give a rip to post it for you. So none of this sneaking around getting somebody to do it for you. You could not start a fire or extinguish a fire on the Sabbath day. That meant if you were going to have a candle for night, you'd have to light it before the Sabbath day started and let it burn all night, all day. Because you cannot put it out and you cannot start it on the Sabbath day. You could not take a bath, whoo, hallelujah, on the Sabbath day because it wasn't that the bath was bad. But the reason you couldn't do that is because some water might spill on the floor and then you'd wipe it up and that would be washing your floor. <laughs> and you cannot cleanse your floor on the Sabbath day. You cannot move a chair on the Sabbath day because if you move it, you might scrape the ground and that would be plowing a furrow. And you dare not do that on the Sabbath day. A woman could not look in a mirror on the Sabbath day for fear that she would see a gray hair and want to pull it out. <laughs> and you dare not do that on the Sabbath day. You cannot carry more than a, the amount of ink it takes to make two letters of the alphabet on the Sabbath day. And false teeth cannot be worn on the Sabbath day because they weigh more 
than a dried fig and you'd be carrying a load. No grain can be picked on the Sabbath day. No harvesting, no grain can be picked on the Sabbath day unless you are starving. And then there was writings by the, on how can you tell when you're starving? There can be no medical treatment on the Sabbath day unless you're saving the person's life. So only the amount of medical treatment can be given to a person that would save their life. Then there was writings on how to save a person's life and what that means. 39 main tasks were outlined in the Talmud. Main tasks that you could not do on the Sabbath. Let me just read some. Follow this list. Sowing, plowing, reaping, binding, thrashing, winnowing, grinding, shifting, kneading bread, uh, shearing wool, bleaching or dyeing wool, spinning, weaving, tying or untying knots, sewing or tearing two stitches, hunting, riding, no, or racing, not more than two letters, building, demolishing, Kindling or extinguishing a fire, hammering, carrying object, all addressed carefully. Sabbath day. Which brings us, that's the context. Now we come to our scene. Verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. What? He's already broken the Sabbath day law on the travel deal. Three thousand feet. Now you understand he's not just wandering around in the grain field. You understand that ground was really, really tight. I mean, precious, and they utilized every space they could, and it was rich. And they used every space they could to produce grain. So the paths that people would walk on to get from one place to another obviously would go close to the grain field. And the grain in its top, it, when, it's, when it's about to be harvested, would be leaning into the path. By Jewish law, there is no problem, Deuteronomy, there is no problem for a traveler to pass through along the grain field and pick grain and eat. He could not get a sickle and go in and harvest, but he could pick enough to eat. That was acceptable. So the disciples are not breaking any law at all if they'd have done this on another day beside the Sabbath day. But it was the Sabbath day. They are walking through the grain fields. They reach out, they grab a hold of the grain, they pick it, that's reaping. We can stone you to death for that. In fact, we will. Stone you to death for that. They obviously, to eat it, have to rub it between their hands, which is thrashing. Now you've broken the Sabbath day law twice, we'll stone you to death twice. Don't die quickly. You blow the chaff away, you've just winnowed. Three times, we're going to stone you to death. Then, you being the way you are, you're going to take too much on your plate and eat more than you should on the Sabbath day. So you're dead four times. Now, what I want you to get is, well, this is all about Sabbath day rules. No, it's not. This isn't about the Sabbath day at all. This is about rest. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How does Jesus view rest? 
How did they view rest? And it's a contrast between the Pharisees and Jesus. I want the mind of Christ. I want to see things like he sees them. I want to be in his camp. I want his heart. I can't get that by just academic study because academic study brings me the same conclusions that the Pharisees did. I should stone you to death. How am I going to get the heart of Christ? He's going to have to give it to me. I'm going to have to be filled with him. So here's the dilemma of the passage. If I feel like they feel, if I see any resemblance between myself and them, if I have any inclination that I just, I, I probably if I were there in that day, I would be in their camp. Then I don't have him. I don't have his heart. And that kills me because I really want his heart. In the contrast, let's begin with this. And we'll try to hurry. You've heard that before, haven't you? Point of view. What was Jesus' point of view? What was the Pharisees' point of view? Now we're talking about rest. We're not talking about the Sabbath day. We're talking about rest. It's interesting that the statement in verse 2, and when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him. Now, the main verb is the word said, the verb said. And obviously, the main subject is they, which the antecedent of that pronoun is Pharisee. So Pharisee, is the main subject, and Pharisees is the main subject, and said is the main verb. Well, what is this the Pharisees saw? Well, that is a verb, you're right, but it's a, not a main verb, it's a participle, which means, it's, it's in the nominative, which means it's an adjective that's defining Pharisees. So it isn't just the Pharisees that said, it's the seeing Pharisees. Or, let's make it a little different term. It's the stalking Pharisees. In fact, as you go on into chapter 15, it was not, and you don't need to go there, but it was not unusual for Pharisees to come all the way from Jerusalem to Galilee just to watch him and the disciples. So can you see these Pharisees? Oh, by the way, the word for saw there is the Greek word oida, which has to do with perceive, grasp, understand. So this is the seeing, understanding, grasping, got a hold of it. You're getting their perspective how they see, how they view this whole thing. So you're getting their viewpoint. Can you see them? They're hanging around behind the telephone pole with their binoculars, watching Jesus and his disciples. Aha! They just picked grain. They march out. They confront Jesus. Your disciples just broke the Sabbath day law three times. We're going to stone them to death. Now, it isn't about Sabbath day, but look at that attitude. 
You with me? Look at the attitude. In fact, it's even stronger than what I just told you because look at verse 2. When the, disciples, when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look! Come on, Jesus, look at him! And if you look at him and see what we see, you'll come to the same conclusion we come to. They ought to be stoned to death. Look at him! And have our same viewpoint. What is their viewpoint? In the contrast, condemnation. They approach everything from condemning. They approach everything from what's wrong with it. They approach everything from how can we get you. They approach everything with how can we uh, make ourselves better than you are. They approach everything from a condemning, trapping, judgmental position. What is Jesus all about? Compassion. The Greek word for compassion is the strongest word for pity. It means a man emotionally affected and deeply disturbed deep within. It's the hand-wringing kind of thing. It's the all-upset kind of stuff. It's the, oh, I can't stand what's going on. Oh, this is terrible. This is, oh, I can't, I can't take what's happening in your life. I'm desperately, desperately concerned about you. Here's the Pharisees who, oh, did you see what they did wrong? Here's Jesus who's wringing his hands, talking about compassion and care. In fact, there's a whole backlog for this if you go clear back to chapter 8 and chapter 9. One story in chapter 8 is that Jesus goes to the country of the Gergesenes because the ship was in the storm and they got clear off base. And they came and he was confronted with, men, with two men who were full of demons. And what did Jesus do? Cast the demons out. And there was a herd of 2,000 pigs there. And they said, the demons, don't just cast us out. Let us go into the pigs. And Jesus said, help yourself. And 2,000 pigs were filled with demons and went wild and ran down a steep place and all drowned themselves in the sea. So can you see the picture? Here stands Jesus. Here's two men in their right mind, two men going back to their family, two men who are, are going to be a part of society, two men who've been redeemed, two men who are back on the right track, two men that Jesus has just wrapped his arm around, two men whose lives are changed by the divine power of God. Here's 2,000 pigs in the sea. The keepers of the pigs ran to the city. Oh, well. Wow. Yeah, you got to tell the owners you're in trouble. Because 2,000 pigs got away from you. The whole town comes out. They look at 2,000 pigs dead. Two men and say, oh, please, Jesus, go away. Leave our borders. You're too expensive to have around. And if we had our choice... We'd have 2,000 pigs and let those guys have the demons back. Wow. The roof is being torn up. The house is full of people. People standing underneath it are, oh, good night, dirt down my back. A bed is lowered right down in front of Jesus. Paralytic. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. Over in the corner, the Pharisees see an opportunity for theological debate. What did Jesus see? He saw a man. The guilt is gone. He saw a man was going to be healed. He saw a man back on his feet. He saw a man made whole. Pharisees saw theology.
Jesus and the disciples were walking along, and there was a table across the street. Nobody goes over there. You know why? Matthew. <clears throat> Makes me want to wash my mouth out just to say his name. He's crud, spilth, betrayed his own people, tax collector, cheats us constantly. If he was on fire, he's not worth our spit. Nobody goes over there. He has no friends. We ostracize him. Jesus goes right over there. Because you know what he sees? A writer of the New Testament. A disciple. While you're peering out behind the telephone pole with your binoculars, what do you see? <gasps> They're picking grain. Get my stones. Or do you see, oh, you know what the whole conclusion of this thing was? This is amazing. I mean, in chapter 11, uh, chapter 12, the whole conclusion of the story, the whole point, the fundamental down to it bottom line point, it's right there in verse 8. Jesus gives it at the climax of his statements. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, I always thought that meant that Jesus, being as he is God, he made the Sabbath so he can do anything he wants to on the Sabbath. That's not what it says. Son of man. That's his identification with us. And he says, for the spirit-filled man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And if you say, I'm questioning your interpretation of that, then you need to go to Mark, his account of this. And you know what Mark says in his conclusion of this? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. See, what's important here is who? People. Not whether you pull out a gray hair on the Sabbath day. See, what's important here is not, oh, did you see what they did? That's not what's important. What's important here is there is the heart of God that says, I love you over the top of all the commandments and that my heart beats for you and there's nothing that you can do that's going to stop me from coming after you. Because you matter more than the commandments. Now see, mentally, I can grasp that. Intellectually, I can get a hold of that. But here's where I have my problem. Do I feel that way? When they do it to you, I don't have any problem. But when I'm offended... Do I have the heart of Christ? Well, I've been reading some books on the heart of Christ and I'm trying to... No. I've got to be filled with him. I want him to take everything that's not like him so completely out of my heart that it's spontaneous within me. Because I got a lot of Phariseeism in me. I'm watching you. Picking that grain. And I still got a couple stones in my hip pocket that I haven't gotten rid of.
Jesus. This isn't about the Sabbath day at all, is it? Isn't about commandments at all. Isn't about rules, isn't about laws. It's about you and me. And am I going to have your heart? Am I going to live in your mind? Am I going to experience your rest? I've been so weighed down carrying stones. I've been keeping my lists. I've been carefully calculating what I can and what I can't do. That I've missed your heart. In the name of Jesus, forgive me tonight for being so judgmental, critical, negative, condemning. Because my laws have mattered more to me than people have. I'm convicted. Heads are bowed. Is there anyone here tonight that desperately wants the mind of Christ? who would risk living in a quote-unquote Jewish society that's filled with its rules and its negativity and its judgments and its criticism, who's more interested in building walls than embracing. Is there anybody here they would like the mind of Christ. Anybody here willing to risk what the pure, unadulterated mind of Christ and his heart would do in and through you? And how would you get his mind? Come to me and rest. Come to me and rest. Ah, come to me and rest. He is loving you over the top of the commandments. Because he wants you. Moments of response. Oh. Would you take on his mind tonight?